Mark Thornton has a special offer for fans of Minor Issues. A free copy of Murray Rothbard's famous work, Anatomy of the State. This is a limited time offer, so act fast. Get yours today at Mises.org slash issues free. Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Minor Issues Podcast. I'm Mark Thornton at the Mises Institute. In this week's episode, we're going to take a deep dive into two huge issues that the mainstream media ignores. It relates to a previous episode on the Oregon problem and drug decriminalization in Oregon. Libertarians need to see this episode and the issues involved. The two fundamental issues that are in play here are one, property rights and our well-being in society and really our survival in society. And two, the pernicious impact on our daily lives of socialist ideology and mentality that has so infected the nation and the world, particularly younger people, maybe less than 40, but it's really everywhere. We also need to know that real full market reform is essential and so much better than incremental reform as in the case with drug decriminalization. So we're gonna be taking a long form deep dive using the podcast I did recently with Rob Taylor. Rob Taylor publishes the Rob Taylor Report from Coos County, Oregon on the Pacific Coast, one hour drive from remote Oregon, but very much impacted by the policies of the state of Oregon. Now we're gonna be discussing measure 110 and we're gonna be discussing property rights because I think that's part of the discussion that's missing. I think one of the greater elements that has happened in Cruz County is the fact that we keep talking about either full-on prohibition. We either talk about full-on prohibition where we're going to lock people up. I mean, Donald Trump, in his remarks on the speech the other night, said he wants to execute all drug dealers. And I think that's an extreme I'm not willing to take. I think it's a bad idea. But then you've got the do-no-harm crowd who want to have safe injection rooms. They want to provide drugs to these people. They want to give out crack pipes. And I think this is a bad idea if it's done with my tax dollars. And so when I I was sent this article by a friend, and it was written by uh, Mark Thornton, and uh, he's a senior fellow at the Mises Institute. And the name of the article, or the title of the article is called The Oregon Problem. It's not drugs. It's the socialistic political culture. And any one of you who lives here in Oregon, you know that's what we're dealing with in Oregon. It's a socialistic culture that we have that's really pressing down upon us. I think Oregon is the is uh, sometimes the trial state for full-on American Marxism that's coming down the road. So joining me right now from the Mises Institute uh, is Dr. Mark Thornton. Mark, how are you doing? Hey, I'm doing great. Um, I'm here live at the Mises Institute. Uh, it's great to be on your program. Uh, I think this is a very important issue. You know, my podcast is called Minor Issues, um, but in reality, we're de- we're dealing with a lot of issues that the mainstream media thinks are minor or irrelevant. Uh, or don't make any sense, but really hit at the heart of the matter. And I think that the opinions and the issues and the statistics that I've seen relating to Oregon and this issue uh, means it's a really big issue Yes, um, with the people out there and, um, you know, similar problems in other states. Uh, and the, the problems... Uh, seem to be spreading. I mean, th- these are these are issues that um, simply didn't exist, except in a couple of very isolated ghetto area areas in the United States when I was growing up, and now it's uh, a common scene in some of America's great states, uh, great cities, 
around the country, uh, places that were not long ago considered utopias. Yeah. You know, and I think Oregon was was in that category that just a few decades ago, people considered it kind of a utopian type of society. And, and now look what's come of it. So great to be here with you. And it's great to have you. Um, I was I woke up at three o'clock last night and I started thinking of all the things I was going to ask you and what I wanted to talk about. And then, darn it, I couldn't get back to sleep because <laughs> issue. you won't believe how much this issue is affecting everyday citizens here. In fact, we are now looking at the development of, and I don't want to call it vigilantism, but the fact that it, the the lawlessness that's going on because no one is is taking care of the um, of the property crimes and the vandalism that's happening throughout our county here in Coos County. And let me tell you how far off we are on the Southern Oregon coast. Just to get to my little city abandoned, you have to go an hour past the town called Remote, okay? So we're, we're way out here in the middle of nowhere, and yet we have crime in our county that's just unbelievable, and it's due to Measure 110, which I did not support, ironically, because I am for drug, uh, the end of the drug prohibition. I've been fighting the drug war for a long time, and not because I support anyone doing drugs. I'm, I'm completely, and would tell anyone that's a bad idea who's thinking of doing drugs, but I saw a long time ago, I was an advisor for the Gary Johnson administration in New Mexico. And, you know, during his second term, I was one of the people working with him to bring him out to start talking about these issues because we were seeing it in New Mexico where the extreme prohibitionists were pushing one way, but the fact was it just wasn't working. I was in a neighborhood where crack dealers ruled the neighborhood, and it, it wasn't any better than what we have now. Um, but now we've gone to the exact opposite because of Measure 110. They have decriminalized drugs, which is far different than legalizing drugs, and that's why we didn't support it. And in your article, I thought you did an excellent job of bringing out the fact that if you're going to have the end of drug prohibition, you have to have the protection of people and property. That is a, an utmost fact with any society. And so I love that in your article. Yeah, I mean, you have to have a substitute. And there has to be rules. You know, private property is a system of rules where my property is my property. I get to do with it what I want. Your property is your property. You get to do it with what you want, and there's well-established rules of what we can do and how we can do it, um, you know, who, who we allow to use our property, how we use our property. I mean, that's a set of legal doctrines that date back for hundreds and hundreds of years. And government, you know, slips in between uh, that system. It carves out a little realm of property for itself. And, you know, we can do whatever it wants um, as long as the voters will go along with it. And that's where the problem comes in, because individuals who own property and who have an interest in being good caretakers of the property and, and getting the most out of that property aren't there. And so the public servants who are supposed to be serving the, the voters and the citizens, they have to act as a substitute. Uh, I think it's important to point out, um, and it's very much related to this point, is that with drug legalization, with true drug legalization that you spoke of, and how different that is, it is than uh, decriminalization, is that with Drug legalization, the types of drugs that would be produced, distributed, and consumed, who would be making them, who would be distributed in them, who would be selling them, who could they be sold to, i.e. not minors, um, would be radically different. 
Okay, so pharmaceutical companies, drug companies would be making these products. Uh, they would be under, you know, legal constraints of being sued uh, for wrongful death, uh, for, um, you know, uh, misadvertising their products, um, product quality. They would be under competitive threat um, from other producers. Um, they could go out of business or they could make a lot of money um, either way. But it's entirely different uh, than in a black market where nobody knows what anybody else is doing, um, where the only incentive on the part of drug producers and distributors is to come up with the craziest, most potent, often the most lethal drugs possible. So, you know, we've gone from a country where people drank beer and uh, smoked pot and there were a, a large number of heroin addicts in cities like San Francisco and New York City um, to, a, to a country that's overrun with, you know, crystal meth, uh, fentanyl, um, you know, right now the black tar heroin from from uh, Mexico is actually relatively one of the safer drugs. Um, right. It's produced in a primitive commercial-like fashion, um, you know, and, uh, and of course under drug prohibition, the potency of pot went from like a half a percent up to way more than 10%. So you got just an extreme reaction as a result of drug prohibition, and the drugs just got worse and worse and worse, more addictive, more dangerous, more deadly. And of course, now we're seeing uh, people exactly. dying uh, from fentanyl all, all over the place. Um, and, and then, of course, we've had uh, um, several decades of people dying in large numbers from uh, prescription opiate drugs and uh, fake prescription opiate drugs. Um, so the problem under government stewardship has gotten way out of control. It's gotten much, much worse. Um, and we've made precious little progress. Now, when I heard that Oregon had decriminalized all drugs, I thought, well, you know, I was hopeful. You know, that, that somebody had uh, said, hey, this is working for cannabis. Maybe it will work uh, for some of these other drugs. And it has, you know, similar experiments in Portugal and Spain, uh, a few other countries that have decriminalized other drugs have, have been much more successful. Um, one of the things that um, you just mentioned is that under a legalization scenario, because the, what we've done in Oregon, and I want to uh, differentiate to people, the, that decriminalization means that for certain large amounts of drugs, for dealing drugs, you're still going to go to jail. And uh, for people who are using low-level amounts of drugs, who are caught with those personal use drugs, they're, going, they're supposed to get a $100 fine. And um, they they get a number. You can call the number and get help if you want help. The help really isn't there. They're, they haven't spent a lot of the money for to provide help in many areas, especially in the rural areas. And um, that, to me, was the bigger problem is that under legalization, as you were saying, the government would regulate the supply. And until we get a handle on the supply, until we get more uh, commercialized, regulated products, that uh, decriminalization would never work just for the scenario you set up. And people are always going to say that, well, you know, yes, drugs will be safer, but people are going to die of drugs. People die of smoking cigarettes. People die of alcohol right now. Those are drugs. Those are legal. In fact, I'm sitting here drinking sweet tea. And that's a refined white powder that I consume every day. And I, there are people out there, hundreds of thousands across the globe, who die of diabetes and other diseases uh, because of sugar. It's a you know, and so 
I'm, I believe that it's still better to have these products legalized and people choosing to use them, knowing the risk, die, instead of what we have here in Coos County, where, and, and this happens all over the United States, is that the gangs, the criminals, control the production, they control the, the, uh, the supply of where it, it's delivered, who's going to sell it, how it's going to be sold, and they control that through violence. And I think that one person, one mother, one father, one child who dies, who's not using drug, who's not involved with drug use, is 10, 100 times worse than people who are going to die, who are going to use legal cocaine, who are going to use legal heroin under our scenario, because I would call it our scenario, because I think you and I are both uh, in the same book of wanting to legalize it. We just don't want to see what's happening right now where people and the government does it here. They, they excuse the criminal activity by saying, well, they're on drugs, so there's nothing we can do about it. You, you agree with that? Oh, yeah. I mean, the potential for what economists call negative externalities, where my behavior uh, could be internalized and I face all the cost of my behavior. But if my behavior negatively affects my neighbors, uh, passersby, and so forth, um, you know, that's, that's the big problem. And property rights does a great job of preventing people from imposing costs on innocent third parties. And, and so what, you know, the rule of law is supposed to prevent people from imposing their externalities on other people. And, but with the government in charge of so much public resources, so much public land, uh, the streets, the sidewalks, government property of all sorts, the schools, um, it becomes a really big problem if government itself doesn't find some way of minimizing my ability to have a negative effect on my neighbors or have a negative effect on just the population in general. And I see that's really what's happening in Oregon. And it really is a matter of policy, but it turns out, I think, that a lot of the public services that most cities and counties and states have, uh, and Oregon certainly has, you know, programs to protect children and uh, programs to help the homeless, um, you know, programs for the mentally ill. But there, um, I've I've learned um, more recently since I wrote that article that most of the public institutions in Oregon um, have become woke along with the population, and they're simply not either able or willing to or instructed to do what a lot of other public bureaucracies do in other states under similar circumstances. And I understand that the police uh, out there are very frustrated with this new rule and that the $100 fine, nobody collects it, um, nobody calls the number, um, and that when people reach out for public assistance for rehabilitation services or child protection services, um, that nobody's answering the phone, or if they do answer, they're doing nothing about it. And I'm afraid that, as I described in the article, and I've learned that the problem is actually much worse than I first suspected is that the ideological problem in Oregon is much worse. Um, I think of Oregon as, um, as more of a rural state, um, you know, cutting trees. We cut trees here in Alabama too. It's a big industry, uh, farming, 
you know, those kind of things. Um, but apparently the ideological basis in the state has changed for whatever reason. Um, you know, and the the policy and the ideology now apparently permeates um, a majority of the voting class, uh, which tends to be concentrated in urban areas, uh, as well as the political class of politicians and bureaucrats. Um, and that really, you know, has a big influence on um, the rules that are enforced, how they're enforced, whether or not they're going to be enforced. And um, when you get to a situation where you have widespread homelessness uh, and you have widespread uh, open public drug use and abuse, um, especially involving children, um, you know, that that indicates to me that it's you know, the, the problem of drug addiction has gone way, way beyond that. Um, and it's ha and it's having a, a very detrimental effect um, in the state. And I think it's probably having a detrimental effect on business and employment. Um, outside employers who get to choose from 50 states um, are going to think twice about locating new facilities in the state of Oregon. Uh, you know, and of course, similar things are true in Central America where this drug trade comes up. Um, it's, it's hurt jobs. It hurts jobs everywhere it goes. You know, there's a few jobs in the black market and there's enforcers, mafia type people jobs, uh, but they're not breadwinner, family-oriented jobs. And I got to think that that's going to um, have a uh, further negative effect uh, for the people of Oregon when, when employers are looking around. They're not already in Oregon. They're looking for a new home, whether that's for production, raw material extraction, distribution, uh, uh, assembly facilities, um, you know, you could well imagine, given the diversity of climate and, and, and natural resources in the state, that a lot of people would be attracted uh, to that for its natural conditions. And I consider this ideological problem and this policy problem not a natural condition at all but a purely man-made man problem of the human mind uh, that's turned away from the traditional institutions uh, that have benefited uh, humanity over the last several hundred years. And you couldn't be more correct. And as someone who, and they'll call me a conspiracy theorist, I believe that the Oregon government, which is run by extreme leftists from the Democrat Party, that they are using this drug decriminalization to destroy the rights of the property owner. And here's the storyline that goes out now, Dr. Thornton, okay. is that um, they will tell you people... They they're they're uh, they are losing their houses. Then they get drug addicted, and then we have to deal with that problem by helping these homeless. And they're calling them the homeless. And I and I, I hear this in my own county by people who get up and try to put that narrative forward. And I always get up and I correct him. I say, no, the story isn't that they lost their house. Then they got it became a drug addict. I said they became a drug addict. They lost their job. Then they lost their house. And now they're living on the street and you people want the rest of us to house these people by raising our taxes and taking up more and more land that's in the private market, putting it into the hands of government to build these shelters for these people. And I believe that it's a way to slowly erode our property rights. And that's what I see happening now. And it's happening 
um, from the, the top down. I mean, it's happening at the governor's office, who has, who has declared several emergencies on, on what she calls houselessness, homelessness. And I have to say that uh, the problem isn't homelessness. The problem is lawlessness, once again. And, and I go back to the fact that if you gave one of these, these meth heads on the street today a house, it wouldn't take but maybe three weeks before they have destroyed the house. It would become just like the shopping carts and the tarps that they live in, in the streets or on the sidewalks or on the front of the business. And you can't take someone who's in a chaotic state and give them a brand new house at the expense of the taxpayer and the property owner, because all you're doing is cutting into the taxpayer and the property owner so that it, it actually creates more homeless because many people are barely able to survive right now. So that's why I think decriminalization is the way they went to not really because they love the addict and they care for the addict, but I think they just hate property. And, and anyone who knows Marx, the, uh, Karl Marx was asked once, what is communism? And he said the, uh, the abolition of private property. And that's what we're looking at today in Oregon. Yes, and I, I just directed a master's thesis that looked at the housing situation in the western states, Washington, Oregon, and California, in particular California, but it applies to all three states. And in all three states, the government wants to restrict the ability of property owners to build housing. Yes. And so in these three states, I know Portland, Seattle, um, all the major metropolitan areas of California, housing is very, very expensive. And basically, the political class in the state has made the use of private property or public property. It's taken that off of the board with respect to creating housing. So what you're saying about the political class wanting to make the problem worse, I mean, they could just be stupid. They, but, they could be, but... Uh, but I think it's more of their Marxist orientation, uh, their, their interest in controlling everything and micromanaging everything as if they were running some bureaucracy or some business. Um, and so they've artificially driven up the price of housing in San Francisco, in the Bay Area, Los Angeles, uh, Santa Barbara, Portland, Seattle, um, all of these places. They've, they've greatly restricted uh, where you can build a house. Right. And so housing is very, very expensive. So if you get into any kind of trouble, you know, like this inflation that the Fed has given us the last couple of years, I've seen stories all over the country, but particularly on the West Coast, where people are exasperated, they're working a full-time job, and the Fed has basically caused prices to rise so much that they can't afford their apartment. They can't afford to make their mortgage payment. They can't afford to move. Uh, there's no place for them to go. So that would reinforce your point about the politicians seemingly and actively working to make the problem worse. Yes. Right? Yes, absolutely. And, you know, unlike your state, and everything that is east of the Mississippi, all the states that are west of the Mississippi, Nevada, New Mexico, California, Washington, uh, Oregon itself, 54% of it is owned by the federal government. 54% of it. And most of it is forest land. It's vacant land. And that right there in itself is part of the problem because we're not being able to utilize that land to, for development. And then you add on the high cost of development fees that could be lowered without raising taxes. You look at the regulations such as the smart, the smart cities, the smart grid regulations that Oregon has put on development. You, get, you can get rid of that without raising taxes. 
uh, things like land use laws. Oregon is the only state in the entire nation that has centralized planning and zoning through the Oregon Development Council, our, our Council on Development and Conservation. And it's 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 complete socialized planning and uh, zoning. I would get rid of that entire council. I would let it go to the counties. Urban growth boundaries that they have created is just an, it, that's just an imaginary line uh, to destroy the development of things. And, you know, you, you take all those into a contributing factor, but yet they're not looking at that up in Salem with the governor or the legislature that's controlled by the Democrats. They're not looking at changing those right now. They're talking about 12 different taxes to tax us, the, the, the producers, instead of doing stuff that would actually encourage development. And they want to develop, they say they want to develop 36,000 houses a year. They're never going to be able to meet this. But that's their goal. And the only way that they're going to do it without changing the things that I suggested is by taking it from those of us who produce. And it's a scary proposition because... It's just going to destroy rural Oregon, and and I believe that that is exactly their intent to get us all into the major cities, so that they can use this for their playgrounds. I don't know. Uh, what do you think of, on that situation? Well, I mean, all the evidence indicates that that is the case, and um, it it's a general problem. I mean, government is driving up the cost of everything, whether it's the Federal Reserve creating money out of thin air or state, county, and local bureaucrats imposing all sorts of restrictive um, covenants and regulations and requirements and paper filing. Um, in this master's thesis, um, I, I noted that uh, the student found that the cost, the government paper red tape cost of producing a condominium in uh, in Southern California was greater than what it would cost you to buy yeah. a completed condominium here in, in the state of Alabama. And sure, you know, uh, but we're not talking about the land, the cost of the land. So this is right. just construction and you know the construction materials can't be that much uh different so it gives you some idea about what um the the paper red tape cost that states and local governments can impose and then the restrictive covenant covenants that the environmental mindset wants to impose so we don't cut down trees and we have this and we have that and all this open land, uh, yada, yada, yada. Um, but if you do that, that means there's no land to build houses and schools and businesses and uh, retail and so forth. Um, and I know Portland, you know, is highly geographically constrained. Yes. Um, you know, so, and then you, you throw the environmental concerns on top of that, um, and it's a, it's a recipe for economic disaster. And I know that this has been going on for quite some time. I've heard the story from friends and relatives that go back 25 years or more. So this is not new. They're just continuing on um, their drive towards uh, control. And and I think you're right. They They do want to control people. They want to um, they, they don't like people out in rural areas. They don't like people who go to church. Right. Um, Oregon is, um, is a state where people are not religiously uh, affiliated. Uh, the only states that have lower religious affiliations are in the communist states of New England. Um, and that works against uh, freedom and property rights and independence uh, because people tend to have a more socialistic mindset. They tend to be more indoctrinated in the public schools. Uh, and so the situation can become ideologically, which is what they want, ideologically it, it weakens you uh, and makes you much more willing to go along 
uh, and the ultimate weakling uh, in society, and the most unfortunates are these drug addicts and alcoholics who have no will really left of their own, and they become a pawn in this whole process. They actually, it sounds to me, they almost become like a weapon that the politicians are using to harm the productive class in society, the people who go to work, the people who own businesses, uh, the people who have to make payroll, uh, the people who have to satisfy the customer somehow or another. Uh, this is all coming down. And of course, as you suggest, they, their only solution, their only go-to solution is we're gonna tax you more, we're gonna hire more people to work for government and we're going to screw up even more people's lives in the process. Right. Um, so if, if, if you don't turn that all around, um, you know, the vitality of the state will just float down river and out to the sea. One of the things that people often confuse libertarianism with is anarchy. They uh, they assume that if you're a libertarian, you're you're an Iran Ayn Rand objectivist, that you're a conservative, that somehow that uh, many ways that uh, you know they, they we talk about laissez faire markets, they they immediately equate that with anarchy. But the thing is, is that we still the 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 reason we have government is to protect the person and the property building streets and bridges and all the other things they do, that's ancillary to the main goal of protecting the person and the property from enemies foreign and domestic. And one of the things that uh, people will tell me, well, Rob, you're a libertarian. You must, you must think that, uh, that, you know, these druggies that are out on the street that, that have no home due to the fault of their own, uh, with or without these regulations, that you don't, you don't want to tell these people they can't sleep on the sidewalk. You don't want to tell these people that they can't sleep in the park. You don't you don't actually want to get them out of the the residential areas where they're building their their campsites. And and I tell them, yeah, actually I do. And I believe that when government, the collective, and, and I believe in the smallest collective that we can have and still survive as a society, that in the collective, when we build sidewalks, they're for walking. When we build roads, they're for roads. When we build residential areas, we have to protect those residential areas. And in fact, I would argue that what they're, they're talking about is the commons. And that's the tragedy of the commons, is that if nobody takes responsibility for it because we all own it, then this is what we're going to get, the real anarchy that we're seeing in many cities and streets. Um, would you agree with that? Oh, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's the chaos. The chaos. The, the chaos. Um, you know, there's lots of different types of libertarians. There's lots of different Republicans, and there's obviously a lot of different types of Democrats. Um, but in general, all libertarians believe in the free society. And it's just a matter of how much uh, government you have how little government you have and what it does. And libertarians agree that there has to be protection for property rights uh, against crime, uh, violence, and invasion. Um, you know, so there's some generally accepted uh, things about libertarianism. And, you know, for the most part, um, I live my life uh, without it really any government intervention to speak of. I mean, um, when I go to the grocery store, there's, you know, the government isn't overlooking that sort of transaction. So we, we go about our lives generally in a free society. And that's what made America great to begin with, is that freedom brings along with it uh, the opportunities for individuals to succeed in life to do better, to do the things that they really wanted to do. Um, and it's the state and massive government interventions, which basically limit people. They tell them, you can't do this job. And no, you've got to be in school until you're 18. And 
Uh, you know, you're demanded to do a lot of things. You're prevented from doing a lot of things. Uh, you have to get a license to do things. You have to pay taxes on your income, your investments. You have to pay taxes when you buy stuff. I mean, you know, so we become a very heavy handed uh, government in this country. We're much less free, but our freedom and nobody denies this. Our freedom is what allowed Americans to become so prosperous and to become the reason why so many people around the world uh, want to come to the United States. I just talked to a young lady uh, yesterday from China, and she was telling me about her life growing up in China and how she always wanted to come uh, to the United States where she would have opportunities, not that she was going to be given anything, but that she could do more or less what she wanted to do and given an opportunity to succeed or fail. And so that's really the key uh, to our success in, in these numbskulls in government and the socialist ideologues in, in the media, in particular, the mainstream media, um, have been able to control our um, education and our ideology, and they've basically turned that story upside down so that the entrepreneur is all of a sudden always the bad guy who's destroying the planet. Uh, but in reality, the entrepreneur is providing people with jobs, providing people with goods and services at a competitive price. That's how the system works. And so if you're living a good life, it's really you're living between the seams of government. Uh, you're, you're serving your fellow man and you're being compensated uh, for that. And very often, uh, you know, us, us lucky ones that are in that position, we don't really um, get involved with government in much any way. I mean, uh, what protects my house and my car and my health are insurance companies, not the government. And um, and so it's really an ideological problem uh, that we've gotten into. And I don't have an explanation as to why the West Coast states um, are particularly uh, problematic or why the New England states are even worse in many respects, uh, you know, when you think of Vermont and you think of Maine and you think of Massachusetts, um, those are very big government states. Of course, they're also still, like many of the Western states, they're still fairly wealthy. Uh, a lot of wealth was built up uh, in a similar fashion that happened in Sweden. Sweden was a very free market uh, country, uh, total free trade, total laissez-faire. They became one of the wealthiest countries in the world. And then the socialists got involved and <laughs> started to break it all down. And um, so, you know, when it comes to economics, we cannot do away with some of the basics like education, like ideology. You know, we've got to know what makes the country great and what makes it prosperous and what undermines it. And I think, you know, you're pointing out the uh, tragedy of the commons, uh, the tragedies that happen with communal ownership and control of resources is really fundamental, Rob. I think that's really, really fundamental. The fundamentals that the young people aren't learning today. And yeah. that's, it, yeah. And, and you know, when Stalin went in to uh, take over Russia and he pitted the, the proletariat against the bourgeoisie, there was a state of chaos that he could take advantage of. And that's why the socialists have to create that chaos so that they can create a new class of bourgeoisie and a new class of the proletariat. We were, you were talking about how the the uh, homeless are almost and I and once again I don't put everyone in the same category in homeless I, I'm talking about the drug addicted criminal are now being exploited as someone who they can use against 
people who are legitimate property owners, once again, creating that proletariat, creating that bourgeoisie, you are someone as a senior fellow for the Ludwig von Mises Institute, Ludwig von Mises, um, I believe he was Australian, right? Or was he? Austrian. Austrian, yes. I'm sorry, I meant that. Austrian. And uh, he saw what was happening with the Weimar Republic, where you had the international socialists fighting the national socialists, the fascist against the communists. And in the dichotomy that we're facing today, they tried to pit what uh, here in America that the communists are on the left, the fascists are on the right, and yet Ludwig uh, von Mises successfully argued in many of his uh, uh, essays that it wasn't that the communists and the fascists were different, they were either international socialists or national socialists on the far left with big government collectivism, or you're on the right who, which would be anarchy if you went to the extreme right, but somewhere farther to the right past uh, the socialism and fascism, just before anarchy, you have the libertarian who believes in the free laissez-faire market. And that is really the, the paradigm that we should be looking at. But yet the news and everyone else keeps talking about the right and left, as in the left is communist and the right is fascist. And I think that paradigm is what needs to be broken when we're talking to each other, which, you know, you see what I'm saying? Oh, yeah. And, and Mises, Ludwig von Mises argued strongly against both of them. You know, he lived in Vienna, Austria. He was, you know, considered the last apostle of free market economics. And when the Nazis invaded Austria and Vienna, they went to his office and to his apartment to get him because he had so he had proven that socialism doesn't work and they wanted to figure out exactly how they could fix their system because it was very chaotic. Uh, Mises fortunately had already left. He went to Switzerland, then to Portugal, and finally to the United States. And then after the downfall of communism in the late 1980s, we found all of his papers uh, from his office and from his apartment in a KGB warehouse in Moscow. So the Nazi SS troopers had gone in, taken all of his stuff, brought it back to an, a Gestapo warehouse headquarters to study it. And then when the Red Army invaded from Russia, from the Soviet Union, they grabbed all of Mises' papers, thinking that he had hidden this secret on how to solve socialism, and they brought it back to Moscow. So they were both, you know, staunch enemies of Mises. They wanted to kill him, and they thought that, you know, he, he had proven that socialism was impossible and chaotic, and they thought he was just making it up and that he really knew how to make socialism work. Right. And, you know, the fact that they were both after him and they both stole his papers um, indicates that they were really two birds of a feather. They hated each other because one was international, one was nationalist. Um, and, you know, Lenin, who took over Russia during the Russian Revolution, it's his birthday this week. And... Um, he would have never, ever come to power had it not been for the U.S. and Canada and France and Great Britain and even earlier Germany itself propping him up um, in Russia. So the fact that we got communism and Leninism and tens of billions of Russians had to die as a result, we actually helped create Lenin. Uh, we actually had troops in Russia during World War I defending the Bolsheviks from the Germans, because the Germans hated, <laughs> hated Lenin, uh, and they wanted to sack him. And we actually stationed troops uh, to try to protect him. So there's a lot of just crazy um, things in history that were never told about. 
uh, were always misled um, uh, in public schools and by the media. And uh, but the, the the truth that you cannot obfuscate, anybody can realize that you know a free society is what allows us to be happy and prosperous. It allows us, it gives us opportunities. It opens up things uh, to strive for. And in striving to do better for ourselves, we're actually serving our friends and neighbors and, uh, and sometimes people around the world. Um, and, and that's really what makes for a good society. When everybody has the opportunity to serve each other, we all end up being better off and we all end up being happier as a result. And communism and socialism uh, don't do that. They do the exact opposite. They cause conflict. That's what's happening in Oregon. They're causing conflict on the city streets, um, in the cities and metropolitan areas uh, of Oregon. And it's a policy that's really when you look at it rationally, it's designed to fail. It, it has to be because with the natural resources that we have in Oregon, just by accident, we should be a huge supplier of those natural resources all over the uh, this country, all over the world. And we're not using those natural resources because we've been hindered by the federal or state government that's in charge. It's funny, you were talking about how America so many times has, was helped out the Russians when, you know, we in, up to the point where, you know, we started fighting a cold war with them. Hoover, under the Hoover administration in 22, he, he sent huge amounts of food because of the starvation that was going on in Russia right after the revolution, which then kind of led into the Holodomor that happened well before the Holocaust. And it's kind of ironic that, uh, you know, we helped out Russia and then look what Russia did to Ukraine, you know, a couple of years later. And it's, we could have prevented that as Americans if we, you know, maybe let some of the commie starves. I know it, it sounds cruel, but it just would have been better if we wouldn't have had that policy of trying to always help them out. Uh, one question I have for you, and I'm, I'm a huge, uh, and I try to read as much as I can, and I'll tell you someone I've never heard about, and you turned me on to him, uh, the, an essay on economic theory by Richard Cantillon, uh, and I may be pronouncing that wrong, but I noticed you were the editor uh, of that book uh, that uh, um, he had written. And I'm not familiar with it, but I, I definitely want to hear some about that. Uh, how did you, uh, you know, how did you end up editing this book? Because this, I, I just read chapter two, and now I want to read the rest of a, the book on it because it it does lay out, it seems like, the same kinds of theories that. Um, uh, Adam Smith was talking about in The Wealth of Nations, and, you know, of course, all the modern uh, 20th century economists, Melton Friedman, uh, Hayek, and such, were also uh, extrapolating. How did you get involved with it? Well, my teachers, I was just lucky to have some great teachers, um, including Murray Rothbard, and um, teachers here at Auburn University who knew of Richard Cantillo, because he wasn't a widely known uh, or discussed figure. Uh, he may be the most important person who's ever lived that nobody really has ever heard of. He was Irish. Uh, he was a banker. He became one of the world's wealthiest persons in the 1720s. He wrote this manuscript in 1730, and he really explained economic theory, very basic stuff across the entire board of economic analysis, you know, prices, money, inflation, employment, standard of living, growth, location, geography, entrepreneurship. He's the father of entrepreneurship theory. Um, and but he was, you know, he was read by Adam Smith. He was read by David Hume, two of the very first a uh, classical economist, very influential, but very mysterious at the same time. 
he was murdered right after he wrote the manuscript, and it wasn't ever published until 25 years after his death. It was published suspiciously, anonymously, uh, by a publisher that had been out of business for decades. Um, and he, he was always um, a man of mystery, but he's really the first person who was able to construct economic theory, you know, such as supply and demand, but really everything else. And he debunked all of the existing notions about money being wealth and just all sorts of nonsensical notions that pervaded economic policy. Um, like you could be, you could, a nation could become rich through protectionism. Um, right. And as much as I dislike modern mainstream economists, even they disagree with that. So we've learned a lot from this guy, and yet nobody really knows much about him. And uh, his economic theory is not widely known as coming from him, but it, at the same time, it's, a, it's widely adopted. Uh, so if you took up principles of microeconomics, you would see a lot of his influence uh, in there, as well as in economic policy, where he was an advocate for uh, free trade, uh, for free professions, and, um, you know, just uh, that the free market worked um, on its own. He used the word regulated in the essay a hundred times, but he used it to show that markets were re well regulated by themselves, not that they required government intervention. Right. So he's really a diamond in the rough. He might be one of the most important thinkers of all time. And he influenced a lot of the great French liberals uh, and English liberals. And by liberals, the European liberal is the libertarian, not right. the democratic socialist. Um, and uh, but the ideas, his name never really stuck with the ideas. And so that's one of my big um, crusades is to show that um, he's really responsible and he, a lot more important than anybody ever thought. And, uh, and I'm finding brand new things um, in this book, uh, even since, you know, the, the, this translation was published 13 years ago, and I'm still finding brand new, surprising, shocking things in this book. Um, that have not yet come to light. So uh, this is a very dynamic um, uh, thing that we're doing here at the Mises Institute. We're not just shilling a bunch of old ideas for wealthy businessmen. We're supported by, um, you know, individuals, families, family foundations. We don't get money from the government. We don't get money from large uh, government bureaucracies. We don't get money from, you know, the big charitable foundations. Um, we're supported by individuals and entrepreneurs, really. So it's a natural home for the father of entrepreneurship theory to have his work uh, retranslated and uh, provided. We actually uh, provide a free PDF of that book and even an audio version of that book for free on our website. So we want to get the word out and we're, we work very intensely with college students, with graduate students who are studying to become economists and social scientists. Um, and we work with the general public. We have conferences all around the country. We have scholars affiliated with us in many, many different different countries around the world. Uh, there are 20 other fledgling Mises Institutes, not a part of us, right. but people who have seen the merit of Ludwig von Mises' work and want to try to do the same thing that we're doing for their country. And so a lot of our work gets translated into other languages. 
my book on prohibition was just translated into Portuguese, um, Spanish, Italian. And so there's a big drive, particularly on the part of young people, college students, and business people or, or wannabe business people uh, to find the science behind what makes the system work. The system of free market capitalism. Maybe, maybe we should start going around like they did in the '30s and having the Christian revival. We will have the Mises revivals. Maybe I, I don't know, but I, I'm hoping that there is a generation coming up that has seen what the last, the wokeism, uh, the the woke generation that we've been dealing with the last, um, well, probably longer than four or five years, probably over the last decade or so, that really has gotten strong over the last couple of years. I would like to see a rebellion, young kids rebelling and having this type of uh, revival for, <laughs> for, you know, this type of free laissez-faire, free market uh, I ideas. And, you know, you could, the history for it is there. And I imagine the publisher who published this book I imagine they, the reason they, they, they did it is because it, it was almost heresy. You know what I mean? I imagine it was almost a danger to be promoting those ideas because it was undermining monarchies and, and such. So I, I'm just... Yeah, I'm, the, uh, the people who published Cantillon's book were the free market leaders uh, in, within the French Revolution movement. You know, there were socialists and so forth, but the free market clique within the French Revolution is exactly the people who published Cantillon's book. So you're absolutely, your guess is right on the mark. And I can tell you that more people are interested in Austrian economics now um, than ever before. It's like a million to one from when I was in college. So, and it's all largely young people, uh, people who are, are in business or wanna go into business. And uh, so it's the future leaders of society are really clicked into this, not the political leaders, right? but the social leaders of community that um, realize that there's, there's an important message here. I'm very optimistic. I know it can be very frustrating for you uh, to read the headlines yes. and to read the misinformation out there, but... Um, from my perspective, I get to see the students and, uh, you know, what they're having to put up with at most universities in the world. And uh, they see a, a, a light go off when they see the science of liberty being explained to them. They might not be able to memorize it, but they can see it. They can recognize it. Yeah, private property does seem to work, doesn't it? You know, it it's, sure does. The entrepreneur is really not that bad of a guy after all. Um, well, I don't think that you will own nothing and be happy crap that's coming out of the World Economic Forum is going to sell to young people. I, I, you know, they you see a lot of them on iPhones, but that itself is property. Their body itself is their property, and I, I agree with you. I, I think it's. I think we're going to see a whole new revival of this theory going in. Um, Mark, I want to thank you so much for coming on. Um, we, I hope we can get you back here again at some point in time. Uh, if people want to see Mark uh, Thornton's, Thornton's work, go to Mises.org. And anything quick you want to say before I get you out of here? Yeah, I mean, I would encourage that, too. There's you know, no registration, no fees. Our books are dirt cheap. You can get free PDFs. We got daily articles coming out all the time about everything under the sun that's written for regular people. And um, it's it's just a great resource. Um, and uh, and I think we're winning the battle, we're, but we're very, very small. And I encourage everybody to uh, take a look and join in because it's very exciting. It's very promising and it's absolutely essential uh, to save the way, our, uh, the way of life that um, we uh, that we want um, and that we deserve, and uh, I think you'll you'll see what we can 
what we can do and why other people are so excited about it. So, and I'm also on Twitter, Dr. Mark Thornton. And, um, you know, so again, uh, join us. We've got lots of scholars that are on Twitter and we have lots of scholars who are publishing every day. A lot of young people publishing every day on uh, Mises.org. It's M-I-S-E-S dot O-R-G. So thank you very much, Rob. I look forward to coming back.